Hi, my name is Rob Garrison. I'm the CEO of Mercado Labs. Welcome to the eighth edition of First Things First, where we introduce you to supply chain thought leaders from across industry, venture, and media. Last month's guest was Jim Tompkins. Uh, Jim's one of the foremost experts in supply chain. It was great having him on the show. He's written more than 30 books. He's got all kinds of awards that he's won. He started 15 different companies, including his latest called Tompkins Ventures. So he's sort of the, the guy to the pro to know in terms of the supply chain. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you missed it, you can catch it at mercadolabs.com forward slash the lab. Hope you'll check it out. It's a great show. Today's guest is Eric Johnson. And so Eric in our industry is a pretty famous guy. He's the tech editor for the JOC. And so he's the pro to know when it comes to technology in the supply chain and um, anything supply chain technology related, actually. So I can't wait to jump into that conversation. But before I do, a quick congratulations to Alejandra Rolón Campise, hope I pronounced that right, Alejandra, uh, for being the recipient of the Let's Talk Supply Chain Diversity Pledge. Once again, Mercado will be donating $100 to this great cause during this episode. So uh, we look for names in your comments and so forth, and we'll, we'll make another award this month for another participant to that great cause. This month, I'm going to do things a little bit differently than what I've done in the past. And so normally I'm going to give you a, sort of the headlines of what's occurred in the last month. And for example, last time we were talking about the pending rail strike. Thank God that didn't happen. But this month, since we've got Eric on, I'm going to sort of go more into a tech theme. And when I talk about tech, tech uh, theme, I'm going to talk about the technical challenges and something that we call the first mile. And the first mile of the supply chain is for when an order is placed until the orders arrived and different than the last mile, it's a lengthy, complicated process. Products are normally being manufactured in the first mile of the supply chain about 8,000 miles away and it takes on average four months, so much different than what we're used to. But I'm gonna talk about first the challenges and then we'll talk to Eric. And at the end of the uh, segment, I'll talk about some of the solutions that we can come up with for how to bridge these gaps that I'm gonna describe here. So, um, First thing I would say is the import supply chain has been filled with something that I call VUCA for the last five years. And so VUCA is an acronym that stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And I would say in the last five years, we've had more VUCA than we had in all of my other years in the supply chain combined. So it's been a super challenging time for importers. And making this even more complex is this slide that appears here. And this is what I refer to as the digital divide. And so, as I mentioned, on average, it takes six months from planning an order to its availability for sale. And what you look for is that orders placed in, say, Q1 of this year aren't going to arrive until Q3. So you really have to think a lot about what you're going to need six months from now. And if you look at this diagram, if you look on the left hand side, what you would see is that most companies have a pretty good handle on planning their order. They either do this to a demand planning system and an ERP, so they take a lot of care to think about what's gonna happen six months from now and plan and create their orders. On the right-hand side, they've usually got great systems actually for filling, their, for filling their orders, and that's typically in the form of an ERP or warehouse management system. And so that's basically how we get the products either from the store or from the website is through these systems for execution on the right-hand side. In the middle, though, is what I call the digital divide. And so this is the roughly four month time that it takes from the time the order is placed with the supplier until the product arrives at the distribution center. So um, just a, a, a huge gap in between those. And this creates two significant challenges. So number one challenge is the product status is largely invisible during this period and it's being managed with Excel and email. So that's a big period of time where things are not being managed with technology. And also, and as importantly, the data isn't flowing in either direction to the planning systems and toward the fulfillment systems. And so it's largely invisible during that period of time. So those are the two big challenges. And uh, even huge companies that I talked about in the last podcast are having trouble with this. So you saw that Target missed their inventory by a billion dollars last month. And that was largely due to not having good visibility to the production for their forecast. And so without connectivity and suppliers, or sorry, two suppliers and digital execution, it's very difficult to drive great results. So at the end of my conversation with Eric, uh, we'll jump back into what are some of the solutions that importers can deploy to overcome this gap. But now I'd like to introduce Eric Johnson. 
Eric, welcome to the show. Hey, Rob. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's strange, having you. strange being on this side of the screen instead of the <laughs> corner. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, Eric's got a great podcast on this show as well, and he's got a great newsletter. He's somebody that I follow very closely, and I've enjoyed learning and listening to Eric for a long time. I've seen him at a lot of different events and um, had, had the good fortune to be on the stage with him a couple of times as well. So, Eric, I think before we get started, if you don't mind, I'd love to maybe have you give the audience a little bit about your background and sort of how did you get started? How did you become a tech editor at the JOC? Yeah, well, first, before I get into mine, when I agreed to be on the show, Rob, I didn't know I was going to be the guest after Jim Tompkins. That's an exceedingly <laughs> difficult, uh, difficult person to follow, so I'll do my best. Um, I've been uh, – so ba my background, I'll go really quick. Uh, about 20 years I've been reporting uh, for various uh, publications on supply chain logistics. Uh, the last four and a half with the JOC, before that, about 12 years with another publication called American Shipper. And before that, I was working with a local newspaper in Long Beach, California, covering ports of LA and Long Beach, which, as we all know, are kind of significant in terms of uh, uh, imports into the US. Um, so yeah, backed into the logistics industry uh, through reporting, backed into technology through kind of the logistics industry starting to embrace technology more and, and meeting someone on on our editorial team when I was with American Shipper to focus on tech more and less on just sort of like traditional providers. So yeah, that's that's the background in a nutshell. So just building off that, Eric, I'm sure, oh, I should, I should say I'm sure, but did you go to school for supply chain or did you have a journalism degree or what was your, okay. So yeah, journalism degree in undergrad, uh, worked in a newspaper in Southern California for a few years, then went back to school because I was really enjoying business writing but I had zero background, like less than zero background in business. So, I mean, like didn't know what I was talking about and it was clear. So I went to grad school. That degree was, um, had an international focus, which touched on distribution sort of strategy. Uh, so I sort of got a little bit of grounding in supply chain in that. Uh, but for the most part, no, no supply chain background at all before I got uh, a, a role covering the ports of LA and Long Beach. So, Eric, the joke we like to make is I've never met anybody yet who grew up saying, you know, I really want to be in the supply chain industry when I grow up. <laughs> so, so I think like most of us, we kind of backed into this thing. But having said that, let me dovetail off that a little bit. Now that you're in it, you know, it, it's I just be curious to hear about your experience, because what I'm learning, and I'm still learning this industry is kind of fascinating. So maybe talk a little bit about your experience now that you're in the supply chain what are you learning and what do you want to share with the audience about the supply chain? Boy, we only have 30 minutes in this show, right? Uh, <laughs> that's too much to cover. So what I would say is, first of all, let's be clear. Um, I have a super advantageous position in that I get to talk to a million people who are actually involved in, in moving things, um, whether it's, you know, physically moving things, managing the movement of goods, uh, helping companies manage that. Um, I am. I have the good fortune of going to sleep at night and not having to worry about where my freight is every night. <laughs> so it's sort of I get all the benefits of the of this industry being international, uh, a ton of different interesting perspectives. Uh, but I don't have to. I don't have the sleepless nights. Um, for me, I think the most interesting thing, you know, it's less that I know a lot of people say, oh, well, once you sort of like get to peer behind the curtain of how things actually move around the world. It's interesting for me. It's just like how many different jobs are there where you get to talk to people all over the world, you yeah. get to travel all over the world. And there's most jobs are very focused on what companies are doing internally, right? So you talk to your own colleagues all day long and you coordinate with them. Maybe you don't even do that. Maybe you just sit and do data entry in your, in your job all day. I get to talk to companies, like a hundred different companies every month, you know? So that's to me, the cool part is the international part and like getting this cross section of different perspectives from companies. Yeah, I totally agree. That's, that's always what I tell people. The, the best thing about this business is that it affects every part of business. So you don't just see one industry, it touches every single industry. And to your point, it touches the globe. 
So yeah, I, just real briefly to, to emphasize that point, I was at an event last month and someone said that 80%, this was a big company. I won't name the company, but it's a big company. Is it 80% of the company's employees are in supply chain, right? 80%. 80%. Wow. So, I mean, it depends on your definition of what in su supply chain encompasses, but like, obviously, you know, it, it's, it, that just emphasizes how important, like what we, what we care about is so. So Eric, before I dive in, I'm going to pull an Eric on you. I want the audience to get to know you a little bit personally. So let's ask, what is your favorite band and why? Oh, oh. <laughs> well, this is an easy one. So uh, I'm glad you asked. I ask this every week, right? So like, why shouldn't, uh, or on my show, I think Rush is like definitely no my way. favorite band of all. I have a lot of favorite bands, but Rush, if you get, if you only let me listen to one band for the rest of my life, it would be good. <laughs> um i why i my carpool on my way to high school freshman year listen yeah. to rush every single day and i thought wow this is like some nerdy technical stuff with a really high-pitched singer i don't know if i'm really <laughs> getting this but over time i just like love them and some of my best friends are big rush fans and we just nerd out like i like i do with you and others on supply chain I'll have like hour long conversations about some little part of some song that Rush does. So Yeah, yeah. I, I love that. I love you to a specific moment in time in your life that was also probably magical, right? You're talking about driving with friends to high school and blasting the music. I'm guessing your neighbors probably hated you in the morning. <laughs> but <laughs> we, we were driving in the car, so hopefully my neighbors didn't get too mad at me. You know? <laughs> Okay, so let's jump in. You know, you've got a really unique vantage point, as you mentioned. You get to talk to everybody and sort of see everything, unlike really anybody else I know. So maybe start with what kind of trends are you seeing? Is there anything that you can encapsulate from all of that diversity in terms of trends that we should be looking for or that you're seeing in the supply chain relative to technology? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that probably the biggest trend over the last few years is, um, well, there's two I'll point to. Um, one is you definitely see companies now really focused on segmenting what's automatable versus what's not right. The, the idea that there will be, I mean, some companies have, you know, their entire marketing campaign is built around this idea of an autonomous supply chain. I don't know if I buy that yet or anytime in the near future, but I think the companies, what they actually are doing is figuring out, okay, what parts of our day-to-day -day processes are actually better off being automated, which ones could potentially be automated and which ones will probably never be automated or at least not in the near term. Uh, and I think that sort of uh, thought exercise is going on, whether it's a shipper, service provider, an asset-based player, right? Everybody is thinking, how do I strip out, not cost so much as like inefficiency, right? So uh, it, do I have someone doing something that is taking them too long. It's not utilizing their brain for anything useful. And it also might be introducing errors or you know some other inefficiency into the process. So, and, and then you've had a whole bunch of companies that have come up and really tried to address that on a really niche basis, right? So that's one area. I, I, I guess the other area I might point to is just kind of the compartmentalization of software, right? So, I mean, you guys focus on it on a distinct area um, that there, there are certainly software providers that want to be catered to like quote unquote end to end supply chains, but there's a whole bunch of other ones that have gotten a lot of traction in the last few years and a lot of funding focusing on some distinct aspect of it, whether it's a mode or a process or a geography and the ability to kind of like put those things together. I think we used to call it best of breed. 10, 12 years ago, you don't hear that word anymore. Now it's like, no, specialization, integrations, uh, cloud, working with cloud, APIs, all that stuff that you know I've been writing about for a decade. It feels like it's really starting to come together in a meaningful way now. That's fantastic. And, and just related to that, do you see those as trends or you think they're here to stay? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the automation, piece is definitely here to stay. It's just, where's the ceiling for it, right? Like, do we get to a natural endpoint? I think we are 
on a path where you can see where the things that are not real value add that people do that are automated, whether it's like, you know, chatbot type stuff or um, data entry, you know, system to system kind of work um, that, you know, there feels like there's a natural endpoint to that. I think where there's still a lot of room to run on the automation side is kind of like decision making support. Uh, a because those the the models that guide those things need to get better over time, and B there's a cultural, you know, kind of aversion to like I'm not letting a computer tell me what I know <laughs> is true. Right? I've been doing this for 20 years. I know I know my partners. I know my customers. I, yes, give me a recommendation, but I'm not letting this thing like make decisions for me. So there's a lot of room to run on that. Uh, on the compartmentalized side, I don't know. I, it's tough to tell. Like I think that whole question a, a decade ago about like by uh, you know best of breed or single product suite. I don't think you know one necessarily went away. It, a lot of it sometimes is marketing, right? Uh, sometimes it's just their cycles where people are tired of kind of like stitching together a bunch of cool things. And they're like, ah, oh, just going to buy the thing that does everything, even if not everything is the best. Um, so I think th that tends to work in cycles, but the automation thing, I don't think is a cycle. Automation is just a, it's a, it's a growth curve. Essentially. It's just how steep is that growth curve? You know, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about either one of those really the way you said them. In terms of automation, do you see one area of the supply chain being automated faster than others? We're hearing about autonomous trucks. We're hearing about robots and warehouse. We're hearing about all kinds of things that are being uh, automated. I can't remember your word. Automatable. Automatable. <laughs> I, don't even know, I don't think that's a real word, actually. <laughs> are there any ones in particular that you're seeing traction in or that you think are more significant than the others? Well, I think the the natural sort of answer is anywhere where there's a defined like physical footprint, it's easier, you know, to automate your yeah. in control, right? It's like the UPS thing versus a like a global a freight forwarder that has to work with a million partners, right? Like the more you own a network or a physical space, the more you're able to control what gets mm. automated. That makes uh, sense. But I, I'm actually like I only have limited time and limited brain cells to focus on things. And while I'm super interested on, on a personal level in autonomous vehicles and autonomous warehouses, I really don't focus all that much on that area. I focus more on what from like a process and a software perspective can be yeah. automated. And I think, you know, if you think about the vault, you know, this from all your various roles on, on literally every side of the, the service triangle um, that, the amount of like work that goes in on a day to day basis from people doing stuff that is just pretty mindless, right? And not very like doesn't drive a lot of like self satisfaction in a job. Uh, the, the amount of stuff that could just be wiped away essentially seems not limitless, but there's, it seems like there's so much to do. I I still think we're in the phase where the the sort of quote unquote easy stuff gets automated. And then we figure out like the tougher questions like, oh, is this replacing jobs? Is this supporting jobs? Is it growing a pie so that there's more, there's fewer people doing a specific job, but there's more total jobs, right? So, um, so two, two related questions, this sort of the second piece, the compartmentalizing and, and the efficiency aspect of it that you're talking about. So one is you, you touched on something which is workers and sort of workforce trends. I'm led to believe that a lot of people entering the workforce now are excited about the ability to get rid of, as you call them, some of those mindless tasks. So they're actually looking forward to using applications versus Excel and email, for example. And then the second thing, I wonder how you think about it. One thing I see is the progress of technology itself is making it easier and easier to do those things in a more uh, compartmentalized way. So when I look at the, the all-in-one, like the ERPs, for example, the SAPs and the Oracles of the world, they do lots of things, but the technology that they built it on, you know, was relatively dated. So, so kind of, can you talk a little bit about what you see in terms of uh, workforce trends driving this and or new technologies driving it? Do you think that's the basis for these things? You know, I don't know if this answers the question exactly, but I, I hope it does. I've had a few conversations of late where people have said, 
um, you know, we have some awesome new colleagues that we've hired and they're in their twenties or so. Um, and you know, they're really, they're bringing a whole new dimension to our company, but you cannot get them on the phone. They do not want to answer a phone and they don't want to answer email even. <laughs> but if I text them, they, they literally text me back before I've even finished texting them. What I want. <laughs> and so that is not, it doesn't exactly address your question, but I think it addresses the idea that, you know, people who are just entering the workforce right now have a whole new like ba uh, foundation for what they see is the tech they want to use, whether it's to communicate, to perform tasks. So it's really, it, it's really about can the people who like us, who grew up on like I pre email, right? Like, can we adapt to, the way they want to work so we get the most out of them because they're the ones who are going to be, you know, essentially driving the, where companies go in the next decade. And so, yes, definitely the, the tech has to be not fun to use. No one, I mean, it's still work, right? But it has to be like less friction. It has to have less friction in it than most of the things that we have become accustomed to using. Right. Yeah, I think you hit it head on. Actually, you say you don't know if you addressed it, but that's an interesting perspective. You know, I grew up in this business with pretty much only email and phone. Yeah. And so the whole notion of those two not being preferred methods of communication and what do you replace it with? Maybe that ties in the second point is technologies progress to the point that they're using that in their personal lives because it's available. It's, it's a much more instant response and it's gratifying. They can do it in their spare time. They can multitask with it. Yeah. Maybe that is the direction. Maybe that is why tech's headed that way or vice versa. Maybe the tech is causing people to head that way. I think what we've talked about a lot over the last decade is like, will how much will like consumer tech bleed into B2B enterprise tech? And we're st I think we're now starting to see the effects of that, like of 15 years of iPhones and Androids. Like that's just people want like, they want to like peruse different icons and apps that don't look like windows 95. They want, you know, they want it to be much more intuitive. Um, so yeah, I, I would suspect that we'll start to see over the next few years, like some like B2B tech is, is presented to the customer. So let me flip the other direction. We only have a few minutes left, but what areas do you see that are under invested? Are you surprised by certain things? You know, I, I still, Frankly, I've been doing this for a long time and there's areas that I see in, in business that I'm surprised that people are still haven't migrated to technology. Are you seeing that as well? Or is it just that the technology hasn't caught up to the demand or there's still people or areas that don't have technology as an option? Yeah, underinvested. So I would say over the last two to three years, I don't know if there's any specific areas I can think of that have been underinvested. There was a lot of funding, obviously, that went into Tons, yes. a bunch of companies, right? Um, over the pandemic, I, I tend to think of things from a user, uh, like an adoption perspective, more than an investment perspective. Um, oh, there you go. Like, I, I mean, I wrote a newsletter a few weeks ago about this, like, if I'm reporting on something, I could care less whether they got a billion dollar funding round sure. or whether they got a thousand dollars from their grandma um, <laughs> to start the company. If it's, if, if they have a product that I, that is addressing an issue that I know to be a problem because my sources have said over and over that that's a problem, then that's what I focus on. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I sort of, this has like been my default answer and it's not going to change. I still am sort of amazed how little collectively has been invested into global trade management software. Um, if I think about like a decade ago, writing about kind of the physical regulatory and data flows all running in parallel and being able, you know, as a, as a shipper, especially to, to like harness those and, and ma manage them in a cohesive way. I still think you still have companies that are like, Oh, we invested in a TMS. And we got this data provider. Hopefully we can integrate the data into the TMS and then, uh oh, we got hit with an import penalty. I guess we should get a trade compliance solution now. It's very reactive, right? Instead of going, oh, if we if we just put a little bit of money into our mutual our company mutual fund, our technology mutual fund, right now, in 10 years' time, 
how much will that be worth? As opposed to like in 10 years time having to invest, you know, 10 times as much as you did if you, if you thought ahead and did this in advance. So, I, I mean, for me, it's, those are the areas that I think are under invested in from an adoption perspective. Yeah, it's interesting. And just with a few seconds left, do you have any theories on why that is? Do you think it's just lack of awareness at the executive level? Do you think that solutions haven't caught up to the, the complexities yet? Any any theories on why? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit on the, I mean, it's always, you're always building solutions with the hope that the market appreciates what you're building. You know, you don't do it blind. Obviously, you know, you survey customers and you survey the market and try to build it around what you know or you think you know. Um, on the shipper side of things, I think it's pretty clear. They, in, whether you're in logistics or even supply chain as a whole, you're sort of always competing with a bunch of other different divisions within your company for a limited amount of technology spent or budget, yeah. right? So you have sales and merchandising and marketing and you know, even like back office, ERP, like accounting type stuff, right? All of those come, not to say that those don't have an impact on supply chain, but if you're trying to buy a distinct logistics solution, you sort of have to like take a number and get in line unless there's some forcing function that, that pushes you up the list of, of people. And so I think that's just generally from a, from a shipper corporate kind of perspective, that's always been the challenge more than anything else. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I do believe that with what we've experienced in the last two or three years, that's likely to change. I think it's kind, of, it's kind of gone up in terms of both the radar and importance. But I think you're spot on in terms of why it hasn't been invested. And in terms of all the priorities, it just hasn't made the hit parade. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah. So um, in closing out, I, I'd like to, first of all, thank you, Eric, for joining. But I want to mention, to please turn into, tune into Eric's show, Log Tech Live. It's the first and third Friday of every month at 10 o'clock Eastern. One of the best shows out there. And if you don't subscribe to his newsletter, you're missing out. It's, it's the one that I'm, it's a must read for me. And I read it cover to cover. Uh, Eric's got a really excellent perspective and um, I've really enjoyed getting to know him and all the things that he's contributed to this industry. It's, it's almost um, amazing, Eric, what you've been able to bring to this industry in such a short time. So thanks for all you do. And thanks for joining the show. I appreciate it, Rob. Really kind words. And thank you so much. Really enjoyed uh, getting to know you over the last few years. And thanks so much for having me on today. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Take care. Thanks, Eric. So the great Eric Johnson, and uh, we'll put all his credentials in there if you want to reach out to Eric directly. Again, he's he's the pro to know when it comes to technology. So I'm going to close out the show um, a little bit different. I'm going to stay with this tech theme. So at the top of the show, I described the digital divide. And so now what I'd like to do is describe the solution, which I refer to as the digital bridge. And you can see that on the display right there. Great graphic um, to talk about what I showed you in the first was a lot of red in the middle. It was a big digital divide. And what I'm showing you here is kind of a bridge across those. And the way that I want to explain this solution, I'm going to do it in the simplest terms that I can think of. And that is to compare it to and contrast it to what, how most of us purchase our own products. And the way we do it in our personal lives is online ordering. And so I'm going to use Bomba socks as my example here, just for simplicity's sake. So if, if I want to purchase, you know, three pairs of Bombas socks, I'm basically going to enter their site. I'm going to select the products that I want to purchase. I'm going to choose my shipping method and I'm going to pay. And so those are the basic four steps of the purchasing. Now, if you flip the script and you look at how Bombas buys their socks, because they're probably buying them from a supplier that's 8,000 miles away, it's quite a bit different. They're not ordering them online from their suppliers and it's primarily via Excel and email. So it makes even those four basic functions that I just talked about when you're buying stuff uh, in your personal life difficult to do. Just as simple as you know, purchasing products online and choosing your ship and methane and so forth. So in reality, there's a lot of additional complexities when you're purchasing stuff online, which makes it even more logical that you should have some kind of an online ordering system. So unlike online shopping, um, the store, or in this case, the factory is 8,000 miles away. So it's not like Instead of buying them online, I can just drive to the store. The supplier or the store is 8,000 miles away. So that's one big difference. Also, the products are made to order. So everything that I place an order for is going to take roughly three months to make. And I'm going to want to know what's happening with that product while it's being purchased. And it's difficult to do that with Excel and email. 
Um, also, as I mentioned, the pro process takes four months in total versus four days. So there's a lot more that I want to be aware of. And if I'm not online, there's a lot of things that I'm not going to be aware of. And the, probably the most important point is that the process and the products are significantly larger in value. So if I'm buying a container load of socks, I'm spending $30,000 for a container load of socks on average. Average purchasing price is about 30 grand, but more importantly, I'm counting on that for about 2X or 3X in sales, 60 grand or $90,000 in sales. It's a lot of money in purchasing and in sales that's going without any technology, any bridge across it. So that's another big risk for importers. And then the last point is that products are crossing borders, which makes it even more complicated. And there's really tech needed. In fact, Eric mentioned it at the, at the uh, bottom of the show is that we have um, global trade management, all this you know, governmental and regulatory complexity that's included in this process and not and fused with technology. So I'll just close it by saying in the end, uh, I think importers want the same results as consumers. They want a transparent, efficient, and timely process, or what I call TET, for their imports, just like we want when we're buying stuff online. We want it to be as efficient and transparent and timely as possible. And the only way to do that is to digitize, connect, and automate the supply chain. So what I believe, and I think Eric touched on this as well, uh, with modern technology, this can be much more easily achieved than even three to five years ago and much more affordably. So as we talked about trends in supply chain, I think this will be the next big one is to digitize the first model of the supply chain and make it as easy for importers to buy their product from their suppliers overseas as it, they make it for us to buy their products from them. Okay, so that's the show for today. Thanks, everybody, for joining. And uh, you can also find my credentials if you want to drop me a line, Rob Garrison at MercadoLabs.com or visit our website, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.